Hey, um, I'm uh, Shankaran, and uh, this is Prayam. So we work on platform security at Meta. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, SysAMR, uh, it's an eBPF-based intrusion detection and prevention tool. So, um, so the agenda for the today's talk is, uh, so today I'll go over uh, the problem statement, and then uh, we'll talk about SysAMR and the features it provides. And then we'll go into some of the interesting use cases we had and uh, some of the challenges we faced along the way. So um, at Meta, where we collect, connect billions of users every day, um, so the risk of cyber threat is really high. Um, so without a strong intrusion detection and prevention solution, Meta's network and host, host could be easily be attacked and leading to unauthorized access, data leaks, and system breakdowns. So in the past, we used um, SC Linux and uh, OS query for intrusion detection and prevention. But uh, with performance issues, we could not able to um, enable SC Linux uh, everywhere in our production environments. And OS query is a snapshot-based system, so it lacks some of the prevention capabilities what we are looking for. So the main problem here is how do we detect um, and stop these advanced cyber threats in real time with low performance hit uh, and scale it. So we ended up building um, SysArmor. So SysArmor is our intrusion detection and prevention tool based built uh, using eBPF. Primarily, um, we use like LSM BPF for enforcement. Uh, the main difference between uh, SysArmor and similar uh, open source tools are SysArmor evaluates its rules and policies in the BPF code, and uh, it's optimized for high performance. So we use. Um, meter attack framework for additional coverage. And then we have currently more than 50 plus BPF hooks. Um, as I mentioned, the rule execution happens inside BPF code, and it's highly configurable. So you can actually enable or uh, disable detections based on different infrastructure. And um, we use uh, like BPF LSM for managed access controls. So, so the detection coverage, so this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, primarily we have uh, coverage for like hardware networking, system calls, privilege escalations, file monitoring, access controls, um, tax, uh, task and process monitoring, and so on. And uh, similarly for prevention, uh, we have like network access protection, file operations, unauthorized privilege escalations, uh, so unauthorized kernel modules, BPF, and so on. So we also support um, response and remediation flow. So we have our detection um, events flow into an offline pipeline. Um, so we have we can write like automated detections or remediations uh, based on those detections. And uh, we have our incident response team who can actually trigger manual remediation step. Uh, so some of the things what we support right now are like file acquisition, um, like endpoint um, actions, network block, and process stop. Um, like, and memory collection and so on. So now, um, so this is one of our interesting like prevention use cases. So we wanted to um, provide like access control for our data disks that stores like really sensitive data. Uh, so the requirements looks like this. So access is restricted by default. Only allowed process will uh, have access to these disks. And uh, so one of the interesting requirement here is like any processes uh, or any tools that these allowed processes invoke will also inherit the same policy. And again, it, it wants option to um, configure these policies using kernel device numbers, magic numbers, or like file or directory path. Um, a, a very straightforward approach would be um, like write a LSM file open hook, and then you actually look for either the kernel device number or file path, and then you look at the process to see if the process is allowed. And then you have to walk through the parent to see if any of the parents are allowed in the list. But the problem with this, since this is a storage um, cluster, so we cannot pass through the tree every time when a file open happens. So what we ended up doing is we ended up having like four LSM hooks to solve this problem. And uh, so we have a task iterator uh, that runs at the start of the process. So it will actually look for each and every um, process in the task and then see if it allows a policy. So it actually uses task local storage to record that information. And then we have, um, like, for task color, 
exe creation. When, uh, when this event ha occurs, we actually look for the task local storage and then if there is any parent uh, information allow, then we copy it over. And then when the actual file open happens, then the policy becomes pretty straightforward. So we either, uh, we look for the process and if it is allowed, we look for the task storage for additional information and then we enforce the policy. Uh, so this is how exactly um, the code looks like uh, for one of these iterators and um, the task alert. And I'll hand it over to Liam for covering detection in the use cases. All right, uh, thanks, Shankaran. Yeah, so um, Shankaran shared um, a, uh, a prevention that we have with SysArmor, but a lot of what we do is uh, collect signal to drive uh, alerts and then response from a response team. So, um, you know, a detection is usually uh, one or more BPF probes that, um, you know, contains logic to filter the data that it's collecting. So, you know, if you're looking at, say, um, the set UID system call, it's called pretty much constantly on any system, and you want to filter out all of those calls that are benign. So we use various criteria. So uh, a simple one is process name. We've uh, abandoned using process name pretty much because it's uh, insecure. A process can easily change its name to something new. Um, and we've settled on using, uh, where possible, the process binary path. So we actually uh, extract from the struct path the, um, the binary path. We, we catch that, that string, uh, in a map so that we don't have to look it up every time for the same process. Um, and we use that as a, um, you know, for example, bash is allowed to do certain things, sudo is allowed to do certain things, that kind of thing. Uh, we also use container information. So we actually um, extract uh, metadata from uh, running containers and uh, inject that into BP, uh, into kernel space and um, can use that to make different uh, filtering rules. And then just uh, things that you'd expect, you know, um, for networking, IP address and port, uh, for a set UID, you know, the UID or GID being used. Um, calling set UID to nobody is fine, whereas calling set UID to root is maybe not fine. Um, uh, once we have that data we, uh, we and we've filtered it, we then enrich it. Um, so we add, um, if we can grab the information for the container that contains the task, and I'll talk about how we do that a little bit later, uh, we'll tag the event with that data. Uh, we also tag it with data about like if there's a relevant SSH session, I'll talk about that later too, um, and give this enriched data to user space that can then be used to generate a high quality event that uh, the response team can take and actually, you know, hopefully do something with. Um, Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, as Shankaran mentioned, uh, one of the big things for us is performance. So we want these uh, probes to have minimal uh, impact on the system. And in fact, um, the systems we run on, generally the, the owners will push back on us if we use uh, too many resources. Um, so we have uh, tools that um, automatically track uh, BPF memory uh, and uh, CPU utilization at Meta. But we also wrote our own uh, tools to track um, simply like the elapsed time of every BPF program. So we record its start and end time and then record the delta in a map for later analysis. And then we can automatically uh, make decisions based on you know, how much CPU time a given program is using or how many times it's been called in the last minute, 10 minutes, whatever. Um, and um, as for like CPU utilization of user space, it's generally extremely low because we're doing as much work as we can in BPF. We're offloading everything we can into BPF. So uh, one of these use cases is uh, tracking uh, TCP sockets. So we're very concerned about processes uh, spawning sockets that uh, are not authorized. So bind um, and connect in particular. Uh, so you know basically ingoing and incoming and outgoing connections. Um, we use. Um, for bind, we use a K probe on the security socket open call. The reason we don't use LSM right now is because uh, we haven't rolled out LS the LSM flag on all of our hosts yet, but um, we will soon. And um, for connect, we use the C group connect call, which allows us to actually um, disable some connects if we wanted to. Um, and then we also look at the accept call on certain hosts. So accept uh, at meta scale is called an inordinate amount of times. Uh, so on many tiers, we don't look at except, we just look at bind. But we, uh, on some tiers where it's called less often, we look at it and th that gives us an idea of what, uh, what sessions are being opened um, 
and um, in, particu in particular, we're looking for sessions um, you know, to and from suspicious places with, uh, with Accept. Um, so we also look at UDP. We uh, look at UDP send message and receive message uh, via the, um, the UDP send message and receive message uh, hooks, or functions rather, we k-probe them. Um, and um, we just do a pretty simple thing. We, we use a map to store the, uh, the outbound uh, or remote IP address and port. And if you see, so the first time you see a packet going to that place, you log it the second and you know, nth time, you just ignore it. Um, and then we clear that map periodically. Uh, so that keeps this uh, relatively performant uh, without, um, you know, while giving us the data we want, which is, you know, where, where is this data going to? Uh, so one thing that uh, we're, of course, very concerned with is the activity of users uh, in interactive sessions. So um, we uprobe uh, bash. There's a, um, a well-known uh, bash read line function that re uh, returns the uh, contents of a, uh, a command that you type into bash. And it's only called when uh, the command is interactive. It's not called for scripts. Um, so it, this actually has really good performance because it's a probe that only fires when a bash command is, uh, is entered. Uh, it's fired at no other time versus other ways of getting this kind of data. Um, but there's a problem with this. The problem is that you have to do a U probe, you have to know where bash is and you have to actually probe it. If you're running a containerized uh, workload, every container will have its own copy of bash. So how do you find all of the, all of the bashes everywhere on the, the host, right? Uh, the simple way is to simply you know, know where, roughly where they are and use various globbing or regexes to find where the bash is. Um, but you actually don't always know that. Uh, it depends on you know, how your container engine works. So what we actually do is we run a BPF iterator, a task iterator, that uh, scans all the tasks on the host and looks for tasks where upid is one, aka it's a, it's a NIT process of a PID namespace. So that's actually now, once you grab that and you grab its real PID, you have the PIDs of every uh, init process of every container on the host and also um, generally system D of your own, uh, you know, the actual host. Um, and then you can just do slash proc to actually find the root of every, um, of every container and from there you can find where bash is uh, pretty straightforward. So, um, so that's what we do to, um, to, and then we probe every single bash and now you have data from every container if someone uses bash on that container. Um, so, why do we care so much about bash? What if someone uses another shell? Well, if your default shell is bash, generally shell code, when executed, will go after the default shell and will then trigger your, your bash. And that's uh, part of what we're look concerned about. We can actually look at the parent process of ba the bash command um, to say, oh, well, that's a suspicious process, right? Like if the parent's SSH, you expect that, that's normal. If it's uh, something else, then maybe that's uh, an exploit in, uh, in process. So um, I mentioned uh, that we can we enrich these events with more data. So um, we can uh, actually tag an event with what SSH session is responsible for it. So uh, we uh, we probe uh, set UID. We originally used a U probe, but we had trouble uh, with uh, keeping track of the right symbols in the binary because the the packaging team kept stripping symbols out that we were using. So <laughs> we went with uh, set UID. Uh, SSH, when it forks and spawns a new session, it calls set UID exactly one time. So this was nice. You now have a probe that fires on, um, you know, SSH spawning a new session. And um, we record the PID of that new session. Now when SSH spawns a new session, it also um, creates a log message that logs the PID of that session and a bunch of information we want, like um, the, uh, the user ID, the key that was used, all this stuff that would identify who's doing something on the box, right? Um, so we then save that SSH PID to a map that we keep, a metadata map that um, is various process metadata stored uh, PID to uh, this metadata. Um, and what we do with that map is we actually uh, have various probes to um, inherit that metadata. So um, on a fork or an exec, uh, that metadata is actually uh, copied to the new process uh, or copied to the PID of the new process. Uh, and what that means is that every child of that SSH session has this metadata that we can then query and get out um, 
the original SSH PID of the, you know, maybe it's the father, maybe it's the grandfather, whatever. Um, and we can use that to look up in a, a, just a normal C++ map um, the, uh, the key, the username, all this stuff that really can't really be faked very well. And, um, and this is, we can enrich any type of event with this data. So if it's a, a network bind, or if it's a bash command, or a, a call to become root, uh, any of that is all enriched with this SSH information. Um, so another problem for us is uh, Python scripts, uh, and scripts in general. Uh, because in, turn, in BPF, you don't see the name of the script when it's run, you just see Python, right? If you get the process name, it's just Python a lot of the time. Or if you try to get the, the binary, right, it's just Python. Um, so what we did is we uprobed um, the Python uh, function that is responsible for loading a script. And um, so every time a script is run, this fires, and we get actually the, the path to the script. Um, so there's a couple things we do with this data. The simplest one is we just log it. And then we have a table, and um, the table tells us, oh, here's all of the scripts that are on your host that are running, which is uh, surprisingly informative. Uh, but the second thing we do, oh, a question? Yeah, go ahead. How do you uprobe, like, is there just one Python binary present there, or how, how, what if I drop another Python binary on the system? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't have any creative solution like I did for Bash. Um, we know where the Python that they are instructed to use is, and there's multiple versions, and we just probe all of them, right, of all the, all the lib Pythons that are in, you know, uh, user lib or, you know, wherever we can find them. But if someone were to, like, maliciously put another Python, uh, we don't currently have a way to find that. Yeah, you wanna? So then what do you do when you have path hijacking, right? Because like you're, you're basically depending on the combination of the, no, the known location of the binary plus your expectation that a function name's gonna exist. But those are really easy to impersonate, so how do you deal with that? So that's a great question. Um, so in general, with paths, uh, the presentation that went right before me is our solution to 90% of the path issues, which is to rely exclusively on signed binaries um, for doing these rules, right? So right now our rules are path-based, um, and we want to change that so that it is based on a, uh, a binary signature. Um, as far as I think your question specifically here is um, that could someone trick me into u-probing the wrong file? Um, they would probably have needed to compromise a bunch of other stuff to, in order to do that, is my thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, sure, they, they probably could. My thought here is that if I'm thinking of SysArmor standalone, um, it's a lot easier to do that than if you're, you know, you, you mentioned you have all these other pieces in play that you're using with this, but if I take SysArmor standalone, it seems like it'd be really easy to, like, screw that up. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, U probes are, um, Interesting because, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they uh, they have a lot of, um, you know, they, they're just limited. You know, one thought that comes to mind as we discuss this is that if we eventually move to this model where all of the binaries on our hosts are signed, then maybe I know where everything is because of that service, right? Um, and then maybe, you know, obviously an illegitimate copy would be not allowed to run and a legitimate copy would not be able to go on the host without us knowing where it is. Um, that's my, <laughs> that's my first pass at a, as a solution, but you're right, it, it's a very hard problem. So I, I think what you folks are doing with the execution provenance stuff and execution integrity with uh, what Song, uh, the work that he's doing, I think that, that would alleviate some of the issues. Uh, you you can transition from the policy like a signature based verification, and then have your policy in the exciter itself, right? Uh, then you know that this is coming from Python. This is coming from a verif verified Python. You don't need to change that, and you can have some custom handlers that are shipped as a part of that executable. Maybe you probe, maybe something else, right? Maybe something that can or orchestrate and send it back to the same logging ring buffer source that you have. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the key here is that. Um, at least, you know, with the, with those other ideas that you can you can make this stronger. Um, I think the the big weakness I think if you want to take this kind of the next level is to figure out how to not rely on file paths for for your 
your trust or your policy management or any of those other things. Because like, it is entirely possible and reasonable to expect a, a user, a, a Python binary or some other binary that has an embedded Python interpreter to exist anywhere arbitrarily on the system and you don't necessarily know what it is. Um, but you do know that if your signatures are trusted or if you have the checksums or the digest or some other like secondary mechanism, whether it's trustful or distrusted, and that's the sort of thing that um, I think would make, you know, you're, you're kind of inching towards this and I think that would actually be a good next step towards like closing a lot of these holes that you got, that you'd have with SysArmor standalone. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with you, and that is that is 100% where we're going. Is um, paths are the best thing that we could work we could get working on our own, and then with you know with Song's help and um, other resources, we're going to be able to to do a lot more. Um, so I just have a few things left. Um, okay, so um, yeah, one. Uh, use case that came up was um, container escapes. So um, a very common way of escaping a container, it's really a whole family, is to abuse the file system in some way. Whether it's to mount the root file system or to use like uh, special files and slash proc. Um, it, files are a problem. So um, what we did was we, um, first we had to figure out how to track container creation and like inject container information to BPF so we know what process is a member of what container. Um, so we track uh, container creation with the cre by k-probing the create new namespaces function. And um, we that k-probe sends an event to user space every time a new mount namespace is created. And we chose mount just because we're doing files, so it seemed reasonable to choose mount. Um, and um, we then query we know when the container was made, so we can then query the container engine to get uh, the container metadata out uh, for that container. We then put that metadata into a map that's indexed by namespace ID. So now, whenever you have a process, you can look up its mount namespace ID and you know what container, like all the container information for that in BPF. Um, so then we look at, we have a kprobe on security file open. Um, when a process opens a file, uh, we look it up, up its container information, we grab Currently we're using the container username because uh, all these containers are created by like the same user, so this was the best field for us. We use that username as a key in a second map, which it contains the allow list of all the files allowed to be opened by that container. So uh, we can then check the file against all the allowed files. It's uh, files and directories actually, so um, you know it, it can be inside a directory, um, and that's allowed. Uh, we do that check, and then we uh, know if someone is accessing a file that's highly abnormal for that container. So how would you think about this in the context of like instantiating a container with a dynamic user context? Because like, for example, in Podman or in, in some Kubernetes deployments like OpenShift, OKD, whatever, what they do is that when they instantiate the container environment, they generate a random UID, GID, and essentially apply it to the execution context. So how would, how would you adjust this to be able to handle that kind of thing? Because that's even starting to trickle down into end spawn and other things. Well, if it's a random UID and GID, that should be fine because we're using namespace ID, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, um, I think um, unless they're spawning, the, the only thing that would trip this up would be if they start spawning like multiple namespaces in the, for the same container, and then we could, there would be adjustments you can make to, to accommodate for that. I think what you the map that you just said with which you have the user ID map uh, and you you look it up you look it up in a second map the first map seems to be uh, to me like a task local storage blob that's the information about what process belongs to what container you can just pass on that information on task alloc right uh, and pass mm -hmm. on that blob the uh, the the what worries me the is the file path usage here again right like you could uh, <laughs> that that is <laughs> Maybe extended attribute based or, or some allow listing based would be better uh, again. Yeah, I think this is the reason that Linux uses adders because of yeah. this problem. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to keep moving for now, but we should, we should sure. discuss probably. Um, but yeah, we could do that. Um, and this was, um, this was really phase one of um, trying to lock down this problem and uh, address some specific issues we had. Okay, so um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up some of the challenges we've run into and kind of you know what our solutions have been. Um, 
the big one is identifying a service. So this seems like it should be easy, but it's actually incredibly difficult to do 100% of the time. Um, so you know, some services run as just processes um, or families of processes, and um, you know, you have limited metadata available to you as a BPF program. Even getting the uh, file path or the binary path um, is actually quite difficult and uh, quite performance. It's a huge performance hit. You actually catch the file path in a map of PID to you know, various metadata um, in order to, um, and yeah, that could be task local storage as well. But um, we, we catch that because it's expensive. Um, and um, this is why we're, you know, the previous talk was really important, was because if we move to binary signatures, we actually have a way to identify uh, the majority of these services. But some services are containers, and they run, you know, one thing or many things inside the container. It's maybe not just one process. So, you know, how do you identify that? You know, C group um, is difficult to parse in BPF. A lot of times, like the container engine will like inject UUIDs into it, which makes it pretty much useless to you, uh, since you can't deal with random information really at all. Uh, and uh, you know, we, again, you have namespace ID, which on its own is pretty much completely meaningless. Which is why we had to create several hooks to just inject information to the kernel to use namespace ID. Um, just to that to that point about like making it because it's hard. I think you need the container manager and the container control plane to to be on your side. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you will be you will be reverse engineering their implementation in BPF, which is hard. So let's say you have Podman or Docker. You need the blob to be set from the user space and have that information generated from there, and yeah. then you maintain the mapping. They Are need to be part of the story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what you're trying to do here, you're trying to design an LSM. And for that, the LSMs have been using the labels. So yeah. w what you will need here is, is, is so, so if you go full path, like what KP has been proposing and so on, so you will soon end up with the need of proper policies, the labels, and basically going towards a proper LSM to be like, you know, foolproof. Mm -hmm. Because, as you said, like you know, so some things you might want to label like inside one container running under the same label. Some things you might want to split, and you know, based on on your use cases, m use cases, deployments, and so on. So, so I think you're here really on the path to full LSM. So you should be looking more like you know how LSMs are looking, kind of solving this, and 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 just implementing it in your framework. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So Tupperware agent does provide the uh, C-group ID. I think we should be utilizing the C-group ID so that you can track all the processes under the container mm -hmm. and can map it with whatever reasons you want to map it. All network policies, what we implemented today, right, like MBFlow, DSPP and all, uh, they all use the C-group ID coming from the agent. Okay. That, that is the easy mapping to all the processes, all the sub-C-group processes of the container. Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. So the, the first word of that sentence was Tupperware does and then a big long thing that makes it easier, which goes back to what you were saying about you have to control the whole yeah. environment and have everybody cooperate. Oh. Yeah. Uh, there was still a question in the chat. Oh, um, okay. Can you talk more about the performance issues you've experienced with SE Linux? <laughs> and maybe I'll extend, how does it compare like to the measurements you did with the BPF-based file system? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, so as far as the performance of our system goes, um, we eliminate, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like, you know, four or five nines of events in kernel space. Um, probably a lot more, actually. Um, so the hooks execute in a few hundred nanoseconds. Um, and um, they just, the whole thing is very fast. The data just gets, we do a few simple checks uh, in the nice path, right? We do a few simple checks. Uh, the data is filtered, you know, 99.999% of the time. That's it, it's done. Uh, it's discarded. 
and uh, the system gets back to pro uh, going on its way. Um, the specific issues with Etsy Linux, I don't know if you remember the, any numbers, Shankaran? No? Yeah, this is sort of, it was before my time that Etsy Linux was eliminated at Meta. Um, but uh, I just, it, that has, uh, it's gone. It, it, like, I, I couldn't use it if I wanted to. Um, it's been removed. Um, and uh, a lot of people had a uh, problem with it. There's literally one place at Meta that it's being used right now, and we're currently replacing it with uh, what Shankaran talked about, um, the, the LSM hook that he wrote. So I saw that you're using K-probes to hook into security file open. Yeah. So it's not, you're, you're not using the LSM because of those indirect calls, right? We're not using LSM because it hasn't been rolled out everywhere yet, the, the flag to enable it. Okay. And the, uh, the other part is for local storage, like I saw you were using a map to index the... Uh yes, so there's a reason for that. Um, we support all the way back to kernel version 5.2, yeah. and um, I needed the functionality to be able to look up the PID of, uh, look up PIDs that I don't have the access to the task truck for. Okay. Um, so that is why. Um, as soon as we get into a, uh, we're ditching 5.2, and um, I don't know if 5.6 5 is everything I need or not, but at some point we'll eliminate that and use task local storage. And the other thing which you mentioned is to store the metadata for each process, right, and pass it on. Uh, you can do it with UUID, right? You can generate, like, it, it doesn't have to be the C group ID or whatever. Right. You can generate uh, your own UUID with the composition of the namespaces that you care of for your mm -hmm. definition of the container. But then you can pass it along, and then for that UUID in another map, you can share this is the container security relevant context for this process tree that I care about. It doesn't yeah. have to be passed on to the blob, but it can be there. Uh, that's sort of what we do. I think the, to answer some of the question about SE Linux challenges, right? One is, of course, the indirect call overhead for us. Second would be the, the ability to integrate into the container control plane seamlessly, and then to, to generate logs that you can easily consume. That doesn't work with Etsy Linux, and here I think it's the same. Right. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, did I have one more slide? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, just real quick. Um, so yeah, the, the challenge uh, is, um, the other challenge we have is working with files, which as we just discussed, um, are treacherous and will betray you. But um, they, uh, so a lot of times we'd like to answer questions like, um, is a file in a certain directory? Um, is a file, uh, um, you know, is, it, is a file in a map uh, of files I'd like to open? Now, as we just discussed, maybe this is an incorrect approach and we should be using X, uh, extended attributes instead. But um, so we did some work to um, parse out this information ourselves because um, BPFD path is like the only thing you really have to work that the uh, helper function you have to work with with regard to files. And it just gives you a string. And also it can't be used in many places. Uh, in fact, I think it can only be used in like a handful of hooks. Um, so we actually parse files out into a, um, a data structure where we store the file names in reverse order because that's what you get when you Go, when you walk the D entry, you get the file names in reverse order. Um, and um, we store the offset of each file name um, in, a, in an array. And then what that lets us do is quickly take um, basically views of the file. If you want its directory, you just kind of move up a few bytes and um, you're now pointing at the directory that it resides in. And then if you want to look at the, you know, the, the parent directory, you just kind of slide along further. And you can put those view, you can use those views to look up into a, uh, a BPF map. Um, so when we want to answer the question of is a file in a certain directory, we just slide along this uh, this data structure uh, doing map lookups until uh, until we've uh, slid to the uh, you know the root file system. Um, so it's not an ideal solution, but it, it does work uh, reasonably qu quickly. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, in general. I wanted to bring up that uh, working with files is uh, and paths is exceedingly difficult in BPF just because of uh, 
you know, you have just C string manipulation functions and, um, you know, very limited number of instructions and, uh, you know, loops and recursion, all limited, so. Okay, um, I believe that's it. Uh, oh, I'd just like to acknowledge the, the kernel team at Meta. Um, they have supported this work a huge amount. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, we really appreciate that. And um, the rest of the, the network platform, uh, platform security is Tiros' team. Thank you. Uh, about your question about file path, do you, do you, uh, it, is, is it not possible to use something like an inode number superblock ID instead of file path set? Have you considered that approach? Yeah, so you can use inodes, and uh, actually there is a, a detection that at Meta that does use inodes that I'm familiar with. Um, but there's the issue that you have to rescan the whole file system periodically to update it. It also um, wouldn't work because in ButterFS, every sub volume gets a reset inode count. They're dynamic and created um, at, mount at mount time. So yeah. you would never have any reliable way of identifying anything. Yeah, you also have to be aware of all the tricks of like swapping files and stuff. Yeah. Um, so um, you can do it, and uh, there is a place where we do do it, but um, it's uh, tricky. So you'll have to hook in, a multi in, in different places to update your map. Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have another. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean. My point was not using exact tuple that I just mentioned, like, but sure. using some al other alternative information on the file system instead of the file path, right? You yes, no, the file path has got to go. <laughs> um, the BPF tax. The BPF tax tool that you mentioned? Yeah. Is, how is that run? Is that just kind of a one-off thing? Do you guys have like a continual process, like continuous benchmarking that you're doing? Um, as you add probes and change things, or yeah, I, I believe it's it's continuously run in prod is my yeah, um, and um, it goes to a table and then so you get like nice charts basically of like you could look at like this week's okay. BPF data like how much CPU did you use and how much memory did you use? Oh, okay. Like for like every release, so if there is any change, any regression. Okay. Yeah. So it's like continuous profiling in production. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And now we have a break until 4.30.